Welcome to the 1,000 Hours Outside podcast. My name is Ginny Urich, the founder of 1,000 Hours Outside. And I tell you what, man, I'm having these guests that I never, ever dreamed I would talk to. This is Carla Hannaford. She is the author of Smart Moves, Why Learning is Not All in Your Head, and actually a couple other books as well. Welcome, Carla. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks for being here. here. I this book changed my life, so I'm I just cannot even tell you how thrilled. I I could not have imagined. I read it in 2018, <laughs> that someday I'd be sitting across the screen from you. So I so appreciate your time. Um, well, I've got your and your idea of a thousand hours. You know, getting getting kids outside is so important right now. Yes, right now especially. Yes, yeah. and it's so good for the parents too. It's like a a win win. Um, So I've got a little bit of your bio here. Carla Hannaford is an award-winning author, biologist, and educator. She's she's sought after um, as a lecturer, consultant, and workshop leader to 51 countries worldwide, quoted in more than 1,000 journals and books, author of four books, all of which are translated into many languages. Carla, congrats. I mean, you have so many accomplishments here. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and about your family? about your journey, how you ended up uh, writing all these awesome books? Well, for one thing, I didn't read till I was 10. And back then, because I'm 77 now, I, it didn't matter so much. It wasn't a big deal. I would have been in special ed because I needed to move. I really kinesthetic. And um, so I have two daughters and, uh, my daughter Breeze had real problems, the same as I did with picking up reading. And uh, so along the way, I ran into basically uh, the brain gym work. I was uh, in Hawaii teaching at the university there. And uh, I was using Georgie Lazarnov's super learning work, which is a beat a second music that helps out the brain waves. And so you can learn better in my university classes. And so I was invited to work with CSAP, Comprehensive Student Alienation Program at an intermediate school there in Kona where I was teaching. And I thought, great, this is good. I can be with my daughter who was just Mm. going into the intermediate school. Well, she was mortified I would do this to her. (laughs) So, People never knew that I was her mom, you know, (laughs) but um, (laughs) this was a little pilot project that I was going to do for nine weeks, and it ended up being four years long in the intermediate school and three years long in the grade school. So I, the next year, the, the, uh, the uh, head of the elementary school asked if I could work with special ed kids in the elementary school, and I thought, wow, this is a a great opportunity because before I started working in the intermediate school, um, Fran Willard, a nurse nurse practitioner said, if you're gonna be working with these kids, you need to know brain gym. And she showed me just four activities, that was it. And so when these kids that were having such troubles came in in the intermediate school, came in to see me, uh, I would have them do these activities. And it was amazing. And they're all movement, you know, mm-hmm. and things that we want to be doing. Uh, and outside, especially, <laughs> is great, but really doing. Um, so I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea what to expect. I had a beat of mu- a second music on in the background. And here are these kids coming in. And all of a sudden, I'm getting teachers coming to me and saying, what are you doing with Leilani? What are you doing with Miley? What are you doing with Sarah? What are you doing with Jesse? I said, well, a little cross crawl, like walking and rolling the ear lobes, the eyes and the hookups. And uh, they were astounded because these kids were making such progress in a short time. I mean, a couple of weeks. Wow. And I especially got this one situation with Jesse. And it was funny when they handed me, they handed me all the files of these 19 
CSAT kids to look at. And I didn't have the time. Single parent teaching full time at university. I didn't read them, thank goodness. So I had no preconceived notion about these kids. And they came in, I just took them as they were. And uh, I thought Jesse was older. He was big, he was tall, and he seemed older than the others. But I didn't know for sure. So when the teacher came in and said, what are you doing with Jesse? I said, well, we do these activities. And she says, you don't know about Jesse, do you? And I said, well, not really. <laughs> I didn't read his yeah. file. Here was a kid that had been beaten from the day he was born. Ah. And he couldn't read, apparently. He couldn't, I mean, they, everybody was afraid of him. He was yeah. mean and big. And I didn't know that. So when he came in, I said, what do you want to do, Jesse? And he says, well, I guess reading. And I says, well, what are you interested in? And he said, motorcycles. And he says, great. I used to have a 650 Norton. So we went Love to the that. library. We got magazines on motorcycles. And we did these activities. And uh, the teacher had come in because he had offered to read in class. And this was two, like two and a half weeks. Wow. I had met with him a couple times. And she was astounded. And from then on, he just sailed. I mean, it was amazing to me. Yeah. And um, so I was like, okay, so what's happening here? What's going on physiologically? And I started looking through the literature and there wasn't any, you know, at that time. Uh, so this was back in the 19... Uh, let's see, when was I exactly there? In the middle of the 1980s, okay? Actually, a little earlier. And uh, there was nothing on this, you know? And uh, everything was about the brain, and we needed to keep kids quiet. We needed to get them sitting down quiet so they weren't distracted, and uh, they didn't shouldn't move, They, you know? Just sit there and learn. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there wasn't anything there, except that I in neurophysiology. And I knew that the brain is all wired according to the cerebellum, the area of the brain that has to do with movement. And movement is key. All of these reflexes that babies and children have to go through in order to be able to stand up and, and write and see things, be able to read, all had to do with movement. And so I started really watching what was happening. And that was when I wrote the first edition of Smart Moves after this, it basically four years of working with students and five years of I'm more really seeing for myself how important movement was. Mm -hmm. So, and then it's just, <laughs> um, it's, it's found, it it's a foundational piece of literature, I think, Thank you know, you. um, in terms of, uh, like you said, the, the path is that, you know, the sitting, sitting, sitting desks and worksheets and and so you know as a parent um, our our situation is that when my kids were really small and we had three right in a row I was just drowning and someone oh, introduced wow. me to the work of Charlotte Mason um, who was an educator in the 1800s an educational philosopher and she said kids should be outside for four to six hours whenever the weather is tolerable and I just remember thinking that was an absurd idea. We don't do anything like that. We sit, you know, or, or we go to a, a short yeah. class. And anyway, we did it one day just to appease a friend. Um, and I thought it was going to be a disaster, but it was a, fab a fabulous day for all of us. And it changed my life. Um, it got it brought me to a place of hope uh, with my parenting. Um, but I didn't know any of the research or any of the benefits besides it just helped me pass the day but within a couple weeks my kids were thriving like you said this change is so fast and you just you notice these things as a parent um and your book made it all make sense to me 
you know. Um, so yeah. let's talk about let's talk about movement um, because I think that as a society we really equate learning with sitting and desks and classrooms and pencils. Um, but what your book taught me and what I have seen firsthand with my children is that learning and movement are so related. And that the movement helps our brain function for and has these lifelong benefits. So, um, so why don't we talk a little bit about that? I know you talked about the brain gym. Yeah. Let me see. Let me read. Let me read a couple. You've got some amazing quotes in the in your book. You say, "Movement activates the neural wiring throughout the body, making the whole body the instrument of learning." And that movement and sensory experiences are the fertile soil for continual brain development and growth for a lifetime. These experiences cause the brain to constantly transform in unimaginably plastic ways. So for parents who may not have heard this or teachers who may not have heard this, because I, I did not know this at all, um, you know, how, how are movement and learning related? Well, right now, I mean, you can pick up almost any journal that's saying, we all have to move. It's not just children, it's adults and it's the older folks. We have got to move. The brain is the last to get it. We take in our world through our senses, through our body, through movement. And so we are realize, suddenly realizing that the top neuroscientists in the world are saying, the only way that we actually learn is through hands-on sensory input. It's really interesting wow. too. Our hands, this great tool, takes 20 years to fully develop. It's the last wow. organ in the body to fully develop. It's our greatest tool. And it's so vital that we be doing hands-on and uh, doing things like this on our cell phone, doesn't on our smartphone, <laughs> doesn't do it. We need to be out in nature doing this. The two areas of the brain that are the largest, the motor areas and the sensory area, the hands and the feet. And so again, we need to be barefoot. The feet yes. give us a lot of information about our world. The hands give us a lot. And you know, you, you see kids and some adults like me, if I, I see a fabric or something, I need to touch it. We need to touch the world in order to understand it. and learn about it, grow in it. Um, I want to talk for a minute about the fact that you went outdoors with your kids as just kind of an experiment. One of the things that really caught my attention was the Danish school system is the top school system in the world. Mm -hmm. Per capita, there's more important scientific research, there's more important art coming out of Denmark than any other uh, culture in the world. And they have a system that the kids are outside. Uh, they got it actually from Germany. Frederick Foible in the 1800s said, you know, if kids, kids are getting sick, they need to be outside. Kids aren't learning, they need to be outside. So Germany for a long time was having kids be outside and then they kind of forgot about it. But Denmark took it on. So did Sweden and Finland and Norway, all of the, the Scandinavian countries that again, have very, uh, you know, are producing very well-educated people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things that happens, first of all, is one parent stays home with the child in the first two years, usually the mother the first year, the father the second. And then when they go back to work, they, they're given back their jobs. They're paid for being home with the children because they find that then they don't end up in prisons, you know, or, or with drug problems and that sort of thing. It's a, it's a long-term. Uh -huh, it's, it's a, a long-term long move. Mm -hmm. fix. And then when the parents go back to work, the children can go to the forest kindergartens which is amazing to me. So I was really fortunate. I was teaching in Kirchard in Germany, Southern Germany. And I had a day off and I walked into the forest and here are all these children, 
ages yeah. two to six out in the wow. forest. And wow. I didn't see an adult for a moment. There was a dog. <laughs> then I saw Patrick. And I said, what is this? And he said, the bulb kindergarten. Bulb is forest. I thought wild kindergarten. You know? wow. And here are kids down in the stream splashing around. And there's kids that are pulling themselves up uh, on up a slope, you know, to and building houses out of sticks that they found and uh, working, learning to work together cooperatively, but learning from the forest and each other. And the thing about nature, about being outside in nature is that we call the golden mean, the Archimedean twist, the, the structures of the plants, all of the plants, the trees, everything are in a certain mathematical proportion, just like our bodies are. And so learning those proportions helps us in two things, mathematics and language. And those are the things that we test kids on all the time, mm -hmm. you know? So being in the forest and learning those early things just in their own bodies, from touch and from understanding it, um, they're getting ready to learn at a higher level. They're when they do go to school, and in those Scandinavian countries, they usually don't go to school before the age of six and a half or seven. Right. And that's when the brain is more on for sitting down and learning linear kinds of things. Before mm -hmm. that, it's more global. Uh, we know that from Maria Montessori and from Rudolf Steiner's work that, um, you know, our first is global brain and understanding the big picture. And then we can start to put it into pieces, the detail. Yeah. So <laughs> it's really just, neat. It's really neat that you got to see a forest kindergarten. Um, you know, we always hear about them and it's so unbelievably different than how things are structured here in the states. I used to teach high school math mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a district around uh, where we live and the last year I taught I was um, administrator for the math curriculum from kindergarten to 12th grade wow. and so I got to be in and out of these different classrooms that I wouldn't have seen otherwise and it was the year that they were ushering in this full day kindergarten and all the kindergarten oh. teachers said, the kids need to play. We have to bring back stations. And all of the time went toward academics. And um, so what an unbelievable difference these, these, you know, these forest kindergartens. And so you talk about this, the sensations, right? We get all these sen mm -hmm. sensations through our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our skin, mm -hmm. our proprioceptors, which I want to talk about our proprioceptors in a minute. But th those are the foundation of knowledge. The, but the quote... There's one quote that I tell everybody, Carla, uh, mm -hmm. and I talk at different homeschool conferences and um, really just anybody I talk to, this is the one I tell them. Because this was the linchpin for me where I was like, oh, I get it. You say elderly people who dance regularly decrease their risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease by 76%. And those that play a musical instrument decrease the risk by 60%. Nine percent, and you talk about how these playful cross lateral movements they enhance and they protect our brain function. And I read that and I was like, oh, this makes sense because when I was watching my children, and at the time they were like three, two, and and just starting and crawling, you know, six months, seven months, wow. you know, they're constantly doing things that challenge themselves. It's self initiated, yeah. right? They they jump on the log and then they go higher and then they climb the tree and then they're trying to spin and and they're rolling and they all on their own they yeah. do these complex movements and so um, that that's what made it make sense to me are that these movements. Mm -hmm. um, they help with all the neural wiring. So you talk in your book about yeah. myelin. I had watched mm -hmm. that movie Lorenzo's Oil when we were kids. So and yeah. you brought that up in your in your book. Um, mm -hmm. But can we talk about those brain pathways and because it well, seems just, like let me yeah go ahead you sorry know, one of the things tying what tying into what you said too uh, 
when I went to these forest kindergartens, and I've been to a lot lately, and ones here in the United States. And what's interesting is, uh, I'm just thinking right now of a Swedish one at, at, in Stockholm, Sweden, um, where the kids have to go like a half a mile into the forest. And so as they're walking into the forest, they're not taking the path. They're yes. climbing the rocks, yes. you know, and my impulse, because they're struggling, you know, these are two-year-olds, two, three, four, up to six. Yeah. And my impulse is to help them. And the adult says, don't help them. They're developing their vestibular system, their yeah. balance system, which is absolutely key for learning. And so they let the children just do what they do. And when the children finally get frustrated and they say, help me, the adults say, how shall I help you? So, mm -hmm. so they have to do deductive reasoning of saying, well, put your hand under my foot or something like that. Wow. But the, the adults do not help the children mm -hmm. unless they ask. Yeah. And then if the child falls and, you know, kids are, Young kids like that, there's a lot of cartilage. <laughs> They're not mm -hmm. going to break too much, you know. And uh, usually it's, it's just they've, they've missed a step. And so what the adults do is they don't run to them. They stand and they look that they're okay, you know. Mm -hmm. And then they open their arms and the kids run and they, you know, hold them for a minute. And then the kids are like, okay, okay. And they go off and play. Wow. But they have to learn they have to explore, just like your children were exploring their environment, you know, jumping on the couches, jumping, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. on the logs, climbing the logs, climbing the, uh, yeah. the rocks. Uh, there are a lot of schools now that are kind of looking at that of having playgrounds that the children actually help to develop that have logs and streams and rocks and stuff for yeah. them to really challenge their system. This is what you're talking about, the vestibular system, the proprioception, knowing where they are in let's, space. Well, let's talk about those because those are words I learned from you. Um, and I grew up, I remember, I remember in school doing worksheets about you know, the five senses. Um, and just thinking these are a waste of my time. It's so, you know, of course, this one is sight or, you know, whatever, that one's touch. But I, I remember learning about the five senses and then learning that there were more, you know, just within the past couple years. And so you talk about the vestibular system is the first one to develop in utero um, and how spinning and getting the brain out of an upright position activates the vestibular sense. So let's, let's talk about that one first. And then I want to talk about the proprioception one too, because that's like the heavy work. Um, but, but what is the vestibular sense and why is it important for parents to know about it? Okay, so the vestibular sense starts with the uh, semicircular canals of the inner ear. And they're actually developed by a month after conception. And they have to do with motion, motion sense, okay? So we're constantly, whenever we move our head, the rest of our body, all of the muscles have different, have to contract in order to hold us up, you know? Um, and we learn this through time uh, from the baby. Also about five months, the fifth, uh, the eighth cranial nerve comes on, the vestibulocochlear nerve. And that's when uh, the fetuses, the, the nerves are starting really to develop throughout the body and they're getting a sense of, of sound. But it doesn't occur until about then, so about 24 weeks or older. And, uh, but it's, it's the first cranial nerve to develop, the vestibulocochlear, to give us a sense of balance. And what do we need on this planet? We have gravity, right? So our greatest challenge <laughs> in our lives is gravity, you know, and how to work with gravity. And so that's the vestibular system assists us in doing that, the motion sense. Um, 
And proprioception is that sense of where we are in space. And, and, um, and that the, the proprioception one, you know, I've read about from your books and then in a couple other places that this is like the push and pull on your joints. So if a uh -huh. child and these are all, you know, when you when you think when you step back and think about it, like vestibular sense, you think about getting your head out of an upright position, right? So it's like, well, what right. movements do kids do? Well, they do wheelbarrow races and they hang upside down on monkey bars and they cartwheel and they somersault and they roll down hills and naturally swing even just on a swing. You know, I remember swinging and you throw your head back and yeah. all of these different things that kids intrinsically do on their own, even even in the school setting, I remember tipping my chair all the time, all the time. We would get in trouble for it. I was always <laughs> tipping my chair back. People would always, you know, sometimes they'd fall, but most of the time you wouldn't. You knew that fulcrum point, like that was like just the right amount back. But if you think about what we're doing today, kids are not moving their heads, right? It's like you're sitting in the car, you're driving around, you're sitting in school, you're sitting on a screen, you're sitting in, you know, you're watching television. Um, mm -hmm. This has completely changed. And so the vestibular sense um, you talk about is sort of like a cornerstone sense, um, you know, where the other things build on it. So what, yes. can, what are some things that can happen if that vestibular sense is not developed to where it needs to be? So we see this uh, one in hyperactive children attempting to get that proprioception. And what they'll do, they run, they can run all day, but they can't stand with balance on one foot. Hmm. So they're missing the balance piece. And because they're missing the balance piece, it affects everything. Because this vestibular system affects the eyes and the movement, constant movement of the eyes. And unless we can constantly move our eyes, we cannot take in information. We know that when our eyes are, when we're present, our eyes are constantly moving in alignment and teeming. And uh, these children have such a hard time doing that. So they're, they're attempting to get it by, yeah. you know, they're, mo they're moving, but they're not moving in a balanced way. They're missing that balance. And so this is not functioning properly. It's interesting to me too, with autistic children or, or people on the autism uh, spectrum, one of the things is they have a difficult time feeling their body, knowing their body, like you were saying, the joints. And so uh, one of the things that we do is we will work with them with their fingers like this, you know, mm -hmm. helping them to feel that, but not just pulling on the fingers, but pushing in on them because it gives message to those joints of where they are in space. And if you see these hyperactive kids or autistic kids, they're running into things all the time. Mm. You know, they're, they're not aware of where they are in space. And so uh, they may pick up a stick and hit kids. They don't mean to, but they, they don't have a sense of distance of space. Uh, and yeah. and um, I have read about um, understanding pressure. So so even in, I think, the regular classrooms, there's starting to be articles about kids that are falling out of their chairs. And this is all kids. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't hold their body upright mm -hmm. or they're banning tag because the kids don't know how much pressure to apply and they're hitting too mm -hmm. hard and they're not mean. You know, they're not trying yeah. to be mean or rough or bullying, but they just mm -hmm. don't physically know, you know, how do you hold a chick without squashing it, you know, or these different things. And that proprioception, which I think is interesting, I have a little bit of background because my midwife, um, her sons went to a Rudolph Steiner school here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so she told me some of this stuff when my kids were younger. She talked about, you know, the kids should be able to reach over and touch their ear, you know, and that shows mm -hmm. that their body proportions, they're ready to read and, and that type of thing. But she talked about, let them carry stacks of wood. And, and I remember thinking, this is weird, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, but ki all my kids all do that. They're picking up these logs and they want to hold <laughs> the wheelbarrow. You know, they're doing yeah. these things that are, you know, they're hanging. So they're feeling that all in their joints. And um, 
I guess it's this kind of like miracle where when you step back and you're like, oh, I don't have to initiate any of this. <laughs> They're just going to do it if I put them in the right environment. It's such a message of hope, Carla, that this is not quite yes. so hard right? That if I just yeah. take them outside and there's some logs and maybe I have a wheelbarrow <laughs> and they're going to kind of get what they need, they're going to direct it. Yes. This uh, Mon Maria Montessori calls it purposeful play hmm. too. Things like uh, even in the classroom or whatever, uh, cleaning, you know, clean, hmm. scrubbing yeah. the floor. And uh, it was funny. I was in a, a classroom there, Maria Montessori classroom. And uh, here was this little two-year-old and he, the chairs are all weighted. So they have to pick the chairs up to move them, which is wonderful. But he had a, a trolley with dishes, china dishes to put out for lunch. And he says, I have to be really careful that I don't, you know, break wow. these. And he's having to set the table. And then a little girl that was two also had gone out and gotten some flowers and she was very carefully point, pouring water wow. into a vase to put the flowers on the table. And, wow. you know, they're, and they're also using knives and um, peelers and, you know, things that are sharp in order to learn the sense of them. You know, usually when they're three, they have to, uh, cut up the vegetables for the lunches and stuff like that. So they're um, having all of these hands on feeling those little different, how much pressure do you have to put mm -hmm. to, to slice through a cucumber and how is that different than a carrot? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah. well, and what about, okay, so then this is an interesting mm -hmm. thing I learned from your book too, is that this is, this is a certain period of time where kids are developing these different senses and that the fluid is moving through the ear and you're developing the vestibular sense. But then for me, for example, I can't even swing anymore without feeling like I'm going to get <laughs> sick. So what, what changes? And, and um, I guess it's important uh, to know that it does change because you kind of have this mm -hmm. window of time. What changes like around adolescence or adulthood that all of a sudden I'm not going to, I'm not somersaulting anymore. Well, you should be. <laughs> I probably. And you, and you do give some spinning. good ideas. You give uh -huh. some really good ideas for adults to continue with What's vestibular happening? work. Um, As when you go through puberty, the fluid in the inner ear, in the uh, cochlea, um, actually it's in the semicircular canals thickens. And so there's these little autoliths, little hair cells and stuff that, and um, little crystals of uh, sand that move when you move. So it's constantly telling you where your head's at, okay? That fluid mm -hmm. thickens. And so when you spin, it takes a little longer for you to come back to stability. Mm -hmm. But we should be spinning. It helps our yeah. balance. I, I know I work with older uh, adults and uh, their greatest fear is falling and breaking something, oh, you yeah. know? And so spinning and children love to spin. Yeah. You know, that's a really important thing because it's activating that whole vestibular system. But we as adults, I still spin. And, uh, okay, this is good to know. Yeah. You know, if you're in water, it's easier kind of to spin, but, uh, online, just spin till you start to feel a little dizzy. And then right behind your ear is a lump. It's called the mastoid bone. And it's in that bone where the semicircular canals reside. So if you hold that, and then you also hold right below your navel, you can't see me doing that right now, but I'm holding, which is the center of gravity on our body. So holding that, you know, and then holding the other side, will you won't get seasick or airsick or car sick. You, you won't no way. be okay. So, but just giving yourself spin until you start to feel a little busy, then do these and then keep spinning a little bit more each day and uh, your balance will be better. It's mm. great. 
Yeah, all the way. I mean, this is sort of what I got out of your book is that these things that we do, and I didn't really think about doing this as an adult now, but that these things that we do, they are protecting our brain for the long haul. And then now you're talking about protecting the body, you know, because if our balance is better, um, there's less likely of a chance to fall. Um, I, I was thinking when you brought up, we went on a little walk this morning. We're doing, uh, it's December, um, mm-hmm. so we're doing like a little outdoor advent. It, they're really simple. But we went out, we did 20 minutes, we were looking for how many birds we can find. And it seemed mm-hmm. like it was going to be silly, but it was fun. Even my 13-year-old, he said, this was kind of cool. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, uh-huh. great. Anyway, great. so, but my five-year-old, she's you know, there's a path, but she's up on the side of it, you know, and, and uh, so you, you talk in your book about, I guess I just love the simplicity, you know, the simple act of walking uphill or on uneven ground helps strengthen the back and neck muscles, thus allowing the head to balance properly so the eyes can more easily team together. So this team together piece Mm-hmm. Um, it's something that I didn't know about either. You know, you think about eyesight in 2020, but then I learned from you about this teaming together and how obviously that your eyes have to track together in order to read. And so how does outdoor play and all those movements, the brain gym movements, how do they help eventually with reading and, and with the eyes tracking together? So just going back a little bit, the eyes are our least accurate sense. Hmm. And vision, only 4% of vision comes through the eyes as light um, and color. 96% is manufactured in our brain from our other senses. So wow. babies, what are they doing? They're constantly touching things, you know, and, and their, uh, their mouth, the, the mouth and the tongue are very a a huge part of the brain are picking up information about their world they're constantly picking up information and formulating a visual field within the brain Hmm. okay so that i can shut my eyes and i can touch something and i can kind of tell what it is from the shape of it okay because i have an internal visual image thereof so they the child needs to be moving and touching, needs hands on, feet on, body on, needs to be crawling through their environment um, in order to pick up an understanding of near and far, hard and soft, you know, all of the different senses that make up, you know, I, I think of my daughters would, you know, touch my face, you know, and mm. lick my, you know, mm-hmm. as it, when they were babies. So they're getting information about their world. The other thing is just what you were saying, walking on uneven ground, we're getting so much information on our feet. And it's good to be barefoot, not right now in December and in the cold. Climate. But even here and there, it's warm enough. And I and yeah, I have found that as soon as as soon as spring hits all my kids take their shoes off. I mean, it'll still be pretty cold and their, their body is craving that one. I, you have a quote in here. I think it's so fascinating. You say the more children can go barefoot, the more they develop their sense of balance and their entire vestibular system, which in turn affects their hearing, attention, language, and all learning. So many of your sentences are so (laughs) jam packed. (laughs) <laughs> There's one sentence. There's so much in that one sentence. So you said it's affecting yeah. their eyes and it's affecting their vestibular yeah. sense, the balance, their attention, just by mm-hmm. going barefoot. Yeah. So the more they can get information, the better off they're going to be. So walking on uneven ground or walking up hills and down hills and, you know, so I know in playgrounds, they try to make it flat and they try to make it soft and um, that's not real helpful. And in the house, you know, we've got all this furniture for them to be climbing on when they're young. And when they're ready, they will pull themselves up on things. We shouldn't have them walking before they're ready. And ready is usually a year of age. 
before that they need to be crawling through their environment because it helps cross lateral it actually helps the eyes to team better when they're crawling then i i know parents i had parents say oh but my child walked when they were seven months and i'm like ooh, are they okay because they need that crawling the crawling uses more of the body uh, and especially the core area in order to do cross lateral movements. Once they're standing up, they're on their legs and they're not doing those cross lateral movements. Later walking, just like you taking a, a walk with your kiddos this morning, um, you're doing cross lateral integrated movements, walking. And we know how important that is. In fact, you know, for everybody, for a lifetime, Mm -hmm. Walking is the key exercise that we know that helps the brain, that helps mm -hmm. everything. And when we're walking, and you talk about the eyes tracking, you know, we're walking and we've got this up and down motion, or especially kids who are running through their environment or crawling, they're constantly mm -hmm. having to adjust their gaze. And so, yeah. you know, they're learning. You talk in here about the rods and the cones, and you say um, that um uh they they're, they're not fully developed until i think around seven or eight and that mm -hmm. most kids are not physically ready to read at age five the the collagen fibers aren't completely shaped until age nine so so mm -hmm. how is this early reading affecting eyesight beyond well, sort of self-esteem <laughs> you know i think it's interesting you started off talking about the first thing you said was you didn't read until age 10 and we are a homeschooling family, so we wait as well, based off of those Scandinavian company uh, countries, mm -hmm. and the Wald and the you know the Rudolf Steiner it's School. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, they don't they don't start until seven or eight, and um, and then they start in a story form. It's really kind of a magical. I learned it all from yeah. my midwife. You know, it's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, for our own kids, when we started later, you know, they learned in just a couple months. I mean, in like yeah. ten minutes a day, little segments is so was really an easy, um, kind of felt like nothing. I don't even really totally know how my fourth kid learned how to read, but she can, you know, I don't, we didn't even, you know, cause there's a lot of kids. We didn't quite finish the book. And then she's like reading to her sibling. I was like, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> you know, um, but well, let's talk about, there's a lot of stigma there. Uh -huh. Um, people, for some reason, people believe that if you're reading early, you're smart and it's not, hmm. you know, and we're seeing right now, a 300% increase of myopia as when children go to school because we're asking them to read and their eyes are not ready to do that. And children will do anything for our love, anything, wow. you know. And uh, so in the Scandinavian countries, what you were talking about is how they start when they go to school is the teacher will say, write me a story, write a story. So the children write, and this is interesting too, they write in cursive. So they'll Aww. write a story. I'll just write a little story here. Interesting. Okay. So they write in cursive like that because that is when we check the brain, uh, do a brain scan like an EEG, uh, when people write in cursive, both hemispheres are active. When they print, hmm. only the left hemisphere is active. Okay. And so we what we know is that the the right hemisphere is actually the key hemisphere up until about the age of eight. So you want them to do this cursive. So they write their story. Now I can't read that, but they can. So they read the story to the teacher. And the teacher says, oh, you really like cats. And they go, yeah. So the teacher says, well, this is how I write cats. And she writes the symbol for what they're interested in. So tying it into that. Well, pretty soon it shows up in all their stories. And they then wow. read their stories to their friends and their friends start using cats in their stories. Aww. because cats are important so they're learning what is emotionally wow. important 
the the symbology, the words that are important for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's there's some consistency going on, and with us, we just give these four and a half, five year olds a book and say, okay, read. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I mean, what a, what a fun ready. way to do it. The one that mm -hmm. stuck out to me from the Rudolph Steiner School was um, my midwife had told me about the king, you know, and the king, he has the sound, you know, whatever. The king needed help and he looked all over his kingdom and he asked, you know, the jester and he asked the farmer and the, you know, no one could help him. And finally the cat, you know, so it's sort of a similar <laughs> thing, right? And, you know, uh -huh. that they share these sounds. And I thought, well, what a fun what a fun way to introduce it, um, you know, and the they same also, thing, they're old enough, you know, their their eyes are fully formed and their ears are fully formed and their adult teeth are coming in, that there's all these physical markers of reading readiness that I'd never heard anyone talk about, you know, until I met my midwife and, and started yeah. reading books like yours. The other thing is singing, you know, and having them sing their favorite songs and write out the symbology for that. So they have something to hook it on to. But singing, they found that uh, children that have dyslexia and dyslexia is a hearing problem primarily. They're not being able to pick up, uh, have dis the distinct different tones. They're unable to pick those up and especially the of language. So they they have a hard time speaking the language as well as hearing it. And so they found two things really help. One is putting them in a choir because when they're singing, you're vibrating the whole body and especially the head mm. and you're picking up these different tones. And then the other, of course, is to get the vestibular system working right, to again, work with balance and uh, what um so, it's it says in your bio that you're a musician uh i read that stuck out to me so what what kind of a musician are you well i play the violin i have since okay. i was seven and, and, and I, your I husband it says your husband okay and my head and i play ukulele everybody plays ukulele these days my husband plays all the woodwinds but he also plays bass and guitar and you know piano and I play piano too I guess but music is really really a key to this also yeah you um, had I had written down a quote where you said that kids who are involved in the arts um score better oh it says students who participate in the arts outperform those who don't on virtually every measure yeah it's a big Absolutely. statement. Another big yeah. statement from your book, right? A big statement. So your your um your instrument of choice is violin. That's your favorite, but you play a lot of them. Yeah, That's it's awesome. interesting too. I talk about that. The violin, the way it sits, it's sitting on bone, so it's sitting here, in my clavicle, and it's also sitting on my jaw. Okay, when I'm playing the violin, and I so I'm getting all this vibration through my head which wow. is helping me, it keeps me alert. It helps wow. me uh, to think cl more clearly. I mean, we know that what you were saying that 69% of people playing a musical instrument don't get the dementia and Alzheimer's. Yeah. So I'm hoping for that. Yeah. And, but the other thing is instruments with a fipple, like those little flutophones. So it doesn't have to be an expensive instrument. The, those little flutophones, or clarinet or something where the fipple sits on the teeth and vibrates the head. We see huge okay. improvement with children that are having difficulties in school or with reading and, and you know. This is this fascinating. It's too, fast. Yeah. I actually didn't think about, because I play the piano. That's, That's like great. my favorite thing to do. We get outside because it helps all of us feel better. But if I could do anything with my time, I would play the piano. But and I started when I was young, like you. But um, I I wouldn't have thought about it in terms. And my husband plays the drums. He's phenomenal. And then our kids mm -hmm, are doing great. piano and guitar and some little different things. And one of them really likes to sing. But um, I wouldn't have thought about it with that with that quote. Sixty nine percent. You know, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have thought about the effect of different types of instruments. 
you know, and, mm -hmm. and how they sit on the body. I've got a friend that plays the harp so beautifully, but that's a heavy oh, yeah, instrument that right, sits yeah. back on her, sh on her shoulder. And, um, that's something really interesting to think about. It makes you want to play all the instruments, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> Just uh -huh. pick up all of the different instruments. Uh, all the instruments give, again, help with math. Yeah, mm -hmm. as you know, because it, it's yeah. giving you the mathematical kinds of things. But yeah. they shouldn't start with that. They shouldn't start by learning notes, but but sit down and pick out their favorite song on the yeah. piano. Yeah. So that they're, you know, being creative with that. Yeah. <laughs> we have only just scratched the surface of your book. It's so fantastic. But I was one more topic that you brought up. Um about the cursive and the hemispheres of the brain that I learned from your book that I didn't know before. Maybe mm -hmm. this can be our last topic here, but, um, and I think you have a book about it as well. So, you know, you know, if you're right-handed or left-handed, um, but I did not know that, that there are these dominance things um, that extended to other, other things like right eye dominance or left eye or, or ear, right ear dominant. So um, how does, well, I guess, can you explain that, you know, the different types of dominances that there could be? And then how does that sort of affect a child's maybe school performance? Um, why is it good to know, um, you know, those different specific things about our kids? Okay, from my research, at about the age of nine weeks in utero, we developed the moral reflex, which is a survival reflex. Okay. And... Uh, what happens is at that time we develop like a lead, lead functions, like a lead hand. So if we have to fight, this hand goes out. You don't have to even think about it. It's a lead function. Or if we have to run, there's a lead leg, a lead foot that will lead us away to run and, and survive. Um, we also develop a lead eye. We're not totally uh, binocular because we've got this nose between our eyes. And so there's one eye that leads, and you can see that if you are, if you make a window like this and you look through it, I don't know if you can see, no, you can't on this, but if I'm looking through this window, there will only be one eye that will look through that window. And when I close that eye, I can't see Interesting. With the other eye. So because we're not totally binocular, they need to track together, but they're not going to be totally binocular, we're seeing a little off. We also have a lead ear and we have a lead hemisphere of the brain. When we look at PET scans, positron emission tomography scan, what you'll find is that one side of the brain in during stress, during survival, it's our stress in our culture is actually survival in the body. Mm. It goes back to, yeah, that's the base of Maslow's hierarchy. We have to survive okay what will happen is one side of the brain will be active the neocortex of the brain will actually shut down by 70 70 to 85 percent wow. during survival not using your frontal lobe at all except for the motor cortex so that you can just survive and, you know anyway so what we find is that we have these dominance patterns and with just the hand, eye, ear, and foot and, and brain dominance, hemispheric dominance, there are 32 profiles that we can get out of that. Yeah. And it's a mi most of them are mixed profiles. So you may be right brain dominant, left eye, you know, right ear, left hand. I mean, there's different, mm -hmm. but it's a survival profile, but also it's a preference profile. So it shows us what our preferences are. Like for instance, I'm right eye dominant. And so when I go in, in and if I were in a classroom, I would want to sit on the right hand side because my eye is going to do this. It's going to go across. Mm to look at things from the left to the right. So there's wow. a whole science that goes with this. Um, because of that, we're different. What's really interesting to me is that 
80 to 90 percent of children that are in special ed classes are right brain dominant. And what it tells me is that our, wow. our curriculum in our schools, our educational curriculum, is not suited to everybody. It's right. suited to those that are logic brain, left brain dominant. Yes. And uh, so we're missing those students that are right brain dominant. And right brain are kinesthetic. They need to move. You know, and so they're the ones that get into trouble because they're always needing to move. They're the ones that are uh, very uh, rhythm oriented, so they're needing to move in relation to rhythm. They are spontaneous. <laughs> they are intuitive. Um, so many amazing qualities. The amazing qualities mm -hmm. that we kind of overlook and say well in our testing we're testing language and math right right you know on, it makes on a very and, and language centers uh the language centers for verbal language are in the left hemisphere hmm. i am all, all right all right dominant when i'm under stress i cannot talk or if i do it's emotional that's the other thing the right hemisphere is more emotional and uh, so you know, we, we want to get rid of the emotion. We want everybody to sit still and be quiet and, and learn. And they can't. I've, I've got to, I haven't can't. read, you have a so, whole book about this and I've got to read it. The dominance factor, yes, how knowing your dominant eye, ear, brain, hand, uh -huh. and foot can improve your learning. I'm reading it. I'm bringing you back on. If you're available, I want to read the other one because it is fascinating yeah. and never heard about it. I, yeah. I, um, when I used to teach, I taught, mm -hmm. you know, I taught math and I taught all sorts of different levels. And so the, um, you know, the sort of entry level math in high school was called something like basic math. They should have had a better name for it. It's these sweet kids, you know? Um, mm -hmm. but anyway, so, you know, you have these, these mm -hmm. children. And, um, I remember that one semester I had a class of I think there was 36 of them and I just love the kids. They're so awesome. And, um, wow. <laughs> you know, but there were so many of them uh -huh. and, and a lot of them had, you know, an individual, you know, an IEP an individual plan. And, um, you know, so they needed some, some different accommodations and so many of them said they, you know, they needed to sit in the front row. And, and I was like, well, I don't, I don't have that many seats. You know, the class isn't even set up to uh -huh. accommodate, but, but interesting to think about, well, it, it should have specified where, you know, our left yeah. side, right side, yeah. you know, that those yeah. things would have really mattered. And so this is such an interesting mm -hmm. um, conversation for educators. Uh, yes. You know, we're missing yeah. that piece. That front row may not matter as much as front left side or front right side, mm -hmm. or maybe the back would have been yeah. fine as long as they're on the right or or on the left. And um, so yeah, I am left-handed. Mm-hmm handed and, and right brain they need to be in the back of the room where they can be they're, they're very kinesthetic they need to be using their hands all the time i, I loved Fiddling this one i love this one <laughs> um you said okay you said whenever touch is combined with the other senses much more of the brain is activated so you talked about having clay you know if kids are moving their hands their brain is activated but then you said you had a woman, a woman who knitted through all of your classes, and you said she never lifted a pencil, but she ended with an A and nine sweaters. <laughs> that was one of my favorite <laughs> little parts of your book of just a reminder that, you know, we don't have to be maybe taking, I'm a doodler, but you know, the kids yeah. don't maybe have to be taking notes in order to learn. Maybe it would be better if they're just sculpting with clay and listening or knitting or those different types of things. So. Yes, absolutely. Well, yeah. Carla, um, I just, this, the book, I, like I said, it gave me hope. It made me excited about all, it made me notice more all the things that, you know, our kids are doing and, and celebrate them. So if people are interested, Carla, in finding out more about you and, um, about your books, can you tell them real quick where, um, where, where's a good place to go? Website or Amazon? Yeah. Yeah, any, you know, if you put my name in anywhere, things come up. And uh, my uh, publishers are Great River Books. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have a lot of information there, too. 
Are there two so, books right now? I know you've written more than two. There's four. Okay. There's four. Uh, Playing in the Unified Field is my latest one. Okay. And uh, Awakening the Child Heart is uh, no longer in, in press, but you can get it, uh, I think, on Amazon. Okay. And, and sometimes you can get used. Okay. Awakening they're all the they're all ebooks at this okay. point too. Um, yeah. And you have a DVD, Education in Motion. Uh -huh. Yeah, so many things. Carla, <laughs> I'm reading these other ones. I guess I don't know. Last night I I um was making sure I was ready and I thought, oh wait, I've missed these other books. I've been so <laughs> focused in on this one. So I'm really uh -huh. excited to read the other ones. Uh, Carla, we usually end with um, a favorite outdoor childhood memory that you have. Um, something that you can think of from oh. your own childhood. Actually, <laughs> all of my memories of outside are great. I, um, we would spend the summer in Iowa on the farm and those were fantastic. I mean, I was outside from dawn until dark, you know, playing with the animals and, and helping in the fields and playing in the hay now with my cousins and just um, being out and about. And I have many, many, I mean, we, I actually grew up in Salt Lake, so we were in the mountains. My folks loved to camp and we camped. And here in Montana, I have, I have a perfect, beautiful, wonderful place up in the mountains. And I go there all the time and hike and walk and just uh, take the time. One of the things I always say to parents or to anybody is stop. Just stop and take the time to look deeply in, you know, wherever you are. Um, it keeps you healthy. It helps you learn better and just be present in the moment. And being in nature right now, we have nature deprivation disorder, nature, nature de, uh, deficient disorder with our children that are not in nature enough. The other thing is they need to touch just what you're saying. And every time we touch each other, that's important too. rough and tumble play outside on the grass, you know, get down yeah. and rough and tumble play. T touch increases nerve growth factor, helps our nerves to grow and helps to stabilize the nerves that we grow. And we're growing nerves until the day we die. So. Wow. Carla, you have just so inspired me in my parenting and with my own life. Um, it is such a, it's such a, a life-changing me message to know that um, we can have these impacts through simple means, um, that it doesn't have to be super difficult. And even in your book, you go through the different brain gym, um, the different brain gym activities and they're you know they're fairly straightforward you know most people can just do them with what they have and they really do make your brain tired I was I remember trying them and they wake your brain up you know I do a couple of them if I'm going to be speaking or so they're just great tools um, and so Carla I so appreciate you and and what you've put out in the world I know you're affecting so many families and so many educators um, around the globe thank you for your time thank you Jenny thank you for what you're doing